Uh, all right, thank you. Um, it's a pleasure to be here today. Um, I am uh, going to be presenting what's a part of a chapter of a book that I'm currently writing on uh, Shine and the topic of ethics. Um, so hopefully I'll be able to uh, condense a little bit of that uh, general argument. There's a lot that's going to go uh, untouched, however, um, but uh, we'll, we'll see what we can accomplish here. Um, okay. When one thinks of the philosophical works of David Stein, uh, one does not ordinarily think of her in a serious way as a moral philosopher. Uh, this is largely because Stein never wrote a text that was titled Ethics, uh, unlike many others, in the, or uh, several others of the early phenomenological school that she was uh, associated with, like Max Scheler and uh, Richard von Gilbert and others. Uh, moreover, on the rare occasion that one finds a, a scholar typically unfamiliar with Stein's work in any kind of depth, willing to ascribe to Stein some kind of contribution to ethical philosophy, it is generally assumed that if Stein has an ethics, it must be an ethics of empathy, given that this is the topic for which she is still most well known, uh, based on the, top, the title of her dissertation. For reasons that I cannot explore thoroughly here, this is fundamentally a mistake particularly as empathy or Einfühlung uh, in, in German, is for Stein merely understood as a cognitive act of understanding of the mind of the other, not automatically some morally significant act demanding a certain kind of moral comportment towards the other. Not that it could not necessarily be taken in that direction as well. The point is, however, it is, that, uh, is that this is not Stein's intention in discussion of the topic. To the contrary, although there is certainly a moral edge to be observed in select passages of Stein's various published works or academic lectures, including those on empathy, it would seem that ethical theory is never the main thematic object of Stein's philosophy, whether in the early exclusively phenomenological phase of her intellectual development, or in the later, later stages informed by her engagement with Thomism and broadly uh, with neo-scholasticism. Among the long list of philosophical concerns which marked her works across her scholarly career, one strains to discern a distinct thematic interest in ethical philosophy. Nonetheless, I would still insist that Stein was consistently attentive to the ethical dimension, which does indeed come to explicit recognition in important passages of her works. Moreover, I argue that Stein's moments of attention paid to ethical insight are by no means merely passing concerns. This is the case because throughout her works, from her investigation into the problem of empathy and her dissipation, all the way through to her ascent to the meaning of being in her magnum opus, finite and eternal being, Stein was consistently concerned with the question of living a genuinely human life. If, as Aristotle insists, and as phenomenolog phenomenologists were inclined to agree, human being and human life are teleologically structured towards the end, and if this end is the genuinely human good with which political science and moral science are likewise concerned, then Stein's wide ranging philosophical project is, to that extent, unified by one single theme. What is the nature of human being and how does one live humanly? And this is nothing other than an ethical theme. Nonetheless, again, the dimension in which the ethical project comes to be symbolized for Stein is not expressed under the rubric of empathy, but rather under the rubric of value and the person, as was typical of the early phenomenologists of the Göttingen, Munich, and Freiburg schools, um, who were her chief interlocutors. To that extent, while Stein certainly did not, like other early phenomenologists, such as Max Scheler, Dietrich von Hildebrand, or even Edmund Husserl, endeavor to develop an ethics in the sense of an explicit and systematically worked out and unified account of the good life from which she proceeds to, do, to discover, deduce, or intuit rules, maxims, principles, virtues, or otherwise for the solution of practical moral problems. Stein was, in a thematic way, still concerned with ethical reality, and provided some important philosophical analyses of that reality. In that regard, then, Stein deserved to be thought of as an ethical philosopher. Moreover, as the ethical concern with regard to the central theme of the person in her work can be said to provide a certain thematic unity equally across Stein's early and later project, Stein's treatment of ethical reality is, for that reason, not merely occasional, but possesses an implicit systematicity of which I would also suggest Stein was fully aware which might readily be made explicit through careful inspection of the work. I cannot explore all the relevant dimensions and directions of her ethical concern here, focusing instead upon the more central core investigation in which the thematic of person and value disclose its lines of ethical investigation, which Stein will follow out in various places across her works. My intention today then 
is not to give a full account of Stein's potential to con contribute such a complete theory of ethical life grounded in a comprehensive theory of human being and human existence in relation to all the major problems of philosophy, which I think she is also engaged in, but merely to add a break what, again, I have suggested is the core area of concern from out of which Stein's ethics unfolds, the correlation of person and value, which lies at the heart of her personalist phenomenology. Turning our attention then to this theme, in On the Problem of Empathy, Stein insists that person is in its constitution essentially correlative to an order of values, such that Stein writes, it follows that it is impossible to formulate a doctrine of the person without a value doctrine, and that the person can be obtained from such value doctrine. Although Stein clarifies in another part of the passage that's quoted that she does not intend to furnish here a complete doctrine of the person, given the preliminary nature of her investigation, she nonetheless has quite a bit to say about the nature of this correlation between person and value, such that even given the partial character of her presentation of the theory of person here, uh, which will she'll, she'll later expand in other works, it is essential to the understanding of Stein's anthropology that person cannot be taken in abstraction from value and vice versa. Moreover, in, her, in spite of her conscientious, conscientious efforts to qualify the results of her own investigation, as by no means a complete theory of value and thus by no means a complete theory of person in the early works. She nonetheless does speak at length regarding the theme of value as Adam Brake's structure and nature of the person and the personal task of becoming. Stein's theory of value, like those of other early phenomenologists, is heavily embedded in Scheler, whose formalismus in the ethic and materialized ethic was widely read among Stein's circle and whose lectures on the topics of the formalismus Stein herself attended. Shaler holds that values are brought to given us through acts of feeling. Uh, he writes that <clears throat> no more than the names of colors refer to mere properties of corporeal things, the names of values refer to mere properties of a thing like given unities we call goods. On Shaler's analysis, values analogous to colors and other such sensuous data in their relation to material objects are not reducible merely to the valuable characteristics of concrete objects taken as goods. This is the case to the same extent that, quote, I can bring to given us a red color as a mere extensive quality, for example, as a pure color of the spectrum, without regarding it as covering a corporeal surface or as something spatial. So also are such values as agreeable, charming, lovely, friendly, distinguished, and noble in principle accessible to me without my having to represent them as properties belonging to things or men." End quote. This insight is of foundational significance for the possibility of ethics of material values in Shaler's sense. In this connection, Shaler insists that all values as material qualities possess a determinate order of higher and lower ranks, which may be borne by concrete real objects, as well as by the states of affairs, acts, ideas, etc. But the essential height of any value as value will be independent of the concrete bearer. Values taken in their essential separability from both things and the feelings, the feeling acts in which they are brought to givenness are not real objects apart from their realization in things, states of affairs, acts, and persons. They are rather ideal objects, and in their ideality, they establish essential relations among each other, analogous to the essential relationships obtaining between color qualities and independence from the real bearers in which they likewise are realized. As realized, these essential relationships are likewise in the things as value bearers. <clears throat> aligning themselves with the essential nature of the values which they bear and which become essential components of the general fabric of meaning within which things are constituted. To that extent, the a priori order of value as an order of ideal objectivities is also, in a sense, an order, of norm <clears throat> an order normatively embedded within the comprehending cosmos of real being, entailing both formal and material laws of interconnection and interrelation of values and value types to one another. Taylor, follows Brentano in elucidating the following formal laws pertaining to all values and their relations with particular value classifications. First, all values may be classified formally as being either positive or negative, characterized by its particular valence as a positive or negative aspect of being. Every value is also subject to a number of axiomatic rules, uh, quote, which a priori fix the relation of being to positive and negative values, end quote. There are four rules concerning the relation of positive and negative values to real existence for Taylor. First, the existence of a positive value is itself a positive value. Second, the existence of a negative value is itself a negative value. 
Third, the non-existence of a positive value is itself a negative value. And fourth, the non-existence of a negative value is itself a positive value. In addition to these formal axioms, Shaler argues the essential interconnection of values with the ideal ought establishes certain formal propositions regarding the normativity of the axioms for specifically moral evaluation. The first such proposition concerns the notion that every ought must be found in values, and that since the existence of a positive value is itself a positive value, one can say that positive values ought to be. Inasmuch as the existence of a negative value is itself a negative value, negative values ought not to be. Secondly, this implies essentially that the very being of what ought to be, namely positive values, is right, and the very being of what ought not to be, negative values, is wrong. In this respect, Shaler endeavors to found the basic notions of morality in a formal axiology, which ties being, value, and ought together into a single phenomenological framework. Thirdly, it is essentially true for Shaler that any value cannot be both positive and negative. Likewise, in regard to any active valuation, it is impossible to hold the same value as both positive and negative. Where a thing becomes the subject of simultaneously conflicting value characteristics, it does so in as much as the thing is composed of a different of different complexes of values intended in the same thing. Now, most controversially, Shaler argues that not only a formal but also a material axiology is possible, which fills in those formal laws introduced thus far with essential content to the development of a hierarchical structure pertaining to identifiable types of values, which may be classified as higher and lower, and occupying fixed ranks in the hierarchical structure of the value world. The givenness of such a hierarchy is phenomenologically apprehended in sui generis acts of value cognition, which Shaler refers to as pre volitional acts of preferring and placing after. Such preferring is just like any act of perception or presentation may be right or wrong, true or false. And thus, the simple fact that I prefer such and such value to another is not the same as the being higher or lower of this or that value in relation to others. Thus, a particular epistemic problem with reference to value hierarchy must not be avoided by recourse to emotivist theories, for instance, which would seek to annul the challenge of securing the real objectivity of values by refusing their objectivity from the start. On Shaler's analysis, that would be to confuse the noetic act of preferring with its intentional nomadic object, far as well language here. Shaler distinguishes between five general modalities or classes of value. They include the values of utility, that is, of the useful and the harmful, the sensible values of the agreeable and the disagreeable, values correlated to value vital feeling, including those qual such qualities as the noble and the vulgar, the excellent uh, and the bad, spiritual values, including a complex of qualities such as the beautiful and the ugly, right and wrong, true and false, etc. And finally, values of the holy and the unholy. Shaler argues that there here that the values of the holy and the unholy are ultimately highest. This is on account of the enduring quality of holiness, the depth of satisfaction in the feeling, which corresponds to its possession, namely the feeling of bliss, altogether distinct, Shaler insists for a mere feeling of happiness in the ordinary sense of the word. Uh, it's a difference to concrete bearers, etc. It is following, it is followed in descending order by the range of spiritual values, vital values, utility values, and pleasure values. <clears throat> Now, Stein closely follows Shaler's analysis in regard to value and its givenness in personal acts of preferring and placing after. For Stein, the human being is constituted as a person in as much as its life of consciousness is characterized by a depth only fully displayed in feeling and especially in value feeling, whereby the human being is disclosed not merely as consciousness or self-consciousness, but as person. As we've already said, Stein does not intend in the context of on the problem of empathy to furnish such a complete theory of person, uh, and thus she is not obligated to provide a complete theory of value either. However, that does not absolve her from the responsibility of delimiting at least the very outlines of an axiology sufficient to clarify the nature of the person to the level needed in order to flesh out the fundamental structure of empathy for the problems of phenomenological theory that she is concerned with in this context. These intimations give clues to a wider axiological theory in play throughout Stein's works and bearing witness to a significant intellectual debt, debt to Shaler and to Brenton and the That being said, while Stein's axiology certainly depends upon the Brentonian and Schlerian tradition of value analysis, 
and likewise depends upon her reader's familiarity with this tradition, uh, as it was a common possession of the phenomenological circles in which she moved. Schein's own analysis of person in relation to value is not a mere repetition of Shaler. In certain respects, Shaler's formal and material axiology seems to be working in the background, and an assumption of Shaler's differentiation and hierarchization of general value modalities is requisite for making sense of Schein's arguments concerning the development of personality. On the other hand, Schein's discussion of value seems at other moments to advance beyond the Schillerian analysis. It will be necessary to attend then both Schein's Schillerian roots, as well as to her own independent use of Schillerian results in the phenomenology of values and its implications in ethics. Now, person is constituted for consciousness in feeling, especially in as much as feeling, quote, announces personal attributes to us. Uh, but especially in as much as these attributes are not mere states of feeling, but rather characteristic position takings with respect to conditions within the world, as Stein understands it. Such feelings as position takings are always intentionally structured so far as they're always about something or other. She writes that, quote, every time I feel, I am turned toward an object. Uh, something of an object is given to me, and I see a level of the object. The particular level of the object to which I am turned and which I see in such feelings is the qualitative value of the object in this manner of appealing to, appearing to me. Thus, for Stein, quote, when I am joyful over a good deed, this is how the deed's goodness or its positive value faces me. Stein initially appears to follow uh, both Husserl and Brentano in affirming here that value of acts occurring in feeling are founded upon prior theoretical acts of presentation. I must know about the deed in order to be joyful over it. Knowledge is fundamental to joy, she says. On the other hand, the notion that a concrete act of valuation of this object as a value bearer uh, is not incompatible as well with the Schillerian concept of what he calls the ordo amoris, so the logic of preferring and placing after uh, in regard to values <clears throat> uh, as essentially preceding and founding possible theoretical acts. So there's a kind of uh, background of debate here between Shaler and Husserl on um, the, the order of foundations of uh, value experience relative to perceptual experience uh, that Stein is endeavoring to uh, involve in here. Um, but Stein is describing a higher level of the static constitution of value bearing objects or goods in the attribute of their value quality as they are given in the course of experience, not a value as an independent thing like objectivity in its own right, but as realized in concrete affairs. Now for Stein, Concrete personality is correlative to the order of values in at least a few different senses, which serve to disclose both the structure of personality as well as the order of values. On the one hand, the particular unique structure of this personality as opposed to that, that is what constitutes the uniqueness of my, my personality as opposed to the uniqueness of the other, is at least in part owing to the idiosyncrasies of my own response to values given in feeling. For instance, I myself might respond quite readily and quite profoundly to the beauty of the symphony, whereas another might be quite insensible to its beauty, and rather than match my experience of rapture in hearing Beethoven's Seventh Symphony, will shrug off the music with a bored yawn. This difference in response to a particular value reveals differences in the structure of each personality and how each is configured with reference to the value of the universe. On the other hand, this difference in personality is not necessarily a matter of pure value neutrality, Although it might go too far too quickly to interpret such differences morally. One, for instance, would, would probably be loath to call such a difference between a personality open to the value of classical music and a person irresponsive to such value would be a morally relevant one. On the other hand, a person who is irresponsive to beauty as such, and not only as realized in a symphony, presents a much more troubling case. One who is blind to beauty as a value obviously lacks something significant in the order of their personality for Stein. Such a person is troublingly superficial. To that extent, one discerns not only an axiologically indifferent correlation between the person and the universe of value, but one also discerns here the correlation between a structure of depth and superficiality in the dynamic structure of the person as such, as it mirrors the essentially ordered hierarchy of values. Stein gives an example which may help to illustrate my point here. She writes that one may have anger over the piece of a loss of jewelry. This anger represents a valued response to the negative value of the current state of affairs. The degree of depth to which this anger penetrates on the one hand gives evidence to the structure of my personality, that I am the sort of person who only superficially or by contrast very deeply 
is affected by the negative value in question. On the other hand, the particular level of my response to this value in relation to other value responses is revelatory of the structure of my preferrings and placings, placings after that Shaler has called the order of Morris, the, uh, uh, the order of values, which here delimits the hierarchical structure of values as my personality to shape itself in reference to them. Thus she writes, anger over the loss of a piece of jewelry comes from a more superficial level or does not penetrate as deeply as losing the same object as the souvenir of a loved one. Furthermore, pain over the loss of this person himself would be even deeper. This discloses essential relationships among the hierarchy of self values, the depth classification of feelings. End quote. Now, several points of convergence between Stein and Shayla become obvious here. First, it is obvious that for Stein, values are given at least subjectively in an ordered hierarchy. Secondly, the structure of the hierarchy is given in and through foundational, pre volitional, and pre desiderative feelings of preferring and placing after. Third, the structure of the personality is revealed in the peculiar way in which the values, the, the rules of preference manifest themselves as an abiding structure within the person. She writes, this correlation makes feelings and their firm establishment in the eye rationally lawful, as well as making possible decisions about right and wrong in this domain. If someone is overcome by the loss of his wealth, that is, if it gets him at the kernel point of his eye, he feels irrational. He inverts the value hierarchy or loses sensitive insight into higher values altogether, causing him to lack the relevant personal levels. In this passage, Stein makes clear both that the value hierarchy is rationally normative in as much as one who feels a value more deeply than the particular value level warrants feels values irrationally, or better, that such a person is characterized by a basic irrationality in the very structure of their personality as value valent. Um, <clears throat> the essential hierarchy of values in this person has been inverted. Personality lacks a proper attunement to the reality of the order of values, and thus to reality as such, in as much as all objects for Stein are constituted as value bearers. It is clear then that Stein poses some form of objective value hierarchy. What is necessary at this stage for advancing civically moral being obviously on display in this passage is to see if we can pinpoint precisely how Stein thinks of this value hierarchy with reference to the project of working out a formal and immaterial axiology as it would be understood by Brentano or Shaler. In other words, the question here is whether Stein possesses any concrete notion or theory concerning precisely how values are constituted as higher or lower, and which value types are so designated as being higher and lower with reference to each other. Stein gives evidence of a formal axiology in several respects. First, she develops, albeit in a highly compact form, an account of value which, borrowing heavily from Shaler, although without explicitly referencing his work, orders all value modalities in general with reference to value of the person. As Stein puts it, one may be the subject of various types of feeling acts of a distinctly social or interpersonal type, for example, feelings of love, hate, animosity, gratitude, etc., which have other persons as the intentional objects of the feeling. Such feelings are ordered on Stein's reading to the person as a bearer of values. However, the level of the feeling in correspondence to the value worn by the person as the specific object of my feeling act will have an impact upon the sort of value that is intended here in the person. She writes, quote, these feelings are firmly established in various levels of the eye. For example, love is deeper than inclination, end quote. The sense in which love is deeper than inclination will have bearing both within the sense in which Stein uses the metaphor of depth and periphery in regard to the constitution of the person as a layering of personal anthropological levels of intentional directness, primarily in and through the living body, for instance, for instance, in perception, through the psychic mechanisms of drives and impulses, or deeper, in a specifically personal structure of inclining or of loving. In each instance, we move deeper into the personal sphere, the more intimately the act is bound up with the personal eye as the intimate center of all personal acts, and living from out of the personal core of who I am. On the other hand, the specific sense of depth re referenced here will tally as well with the subjective experience of the depth at which I feel the value of the other as something that either does or does not touch the core of my own personal existence. In part, the depth at which I feel my love for another may serve as a revelation of the specific height of the personal value which it intends. 
but this may also depend upon the subjective conditions of my act of love, whether it is authentically lived or whether it is inauthentic, whether I live out of this love in my comportment towards the other, or whether I hold myself remote from it, among other possible conditions which might affect the depth at which such love is felt in response to the personal value in question here. However, formally or essentially, the nature of love is such that by contrast to mere inclination, it will always arise out of a personal layer that is essentially distinct uh, from mere psychophysical sensibility, as Schleimer understands it. So much for the intentional act of value feeling, where the subject side of the act is concerned. However, Schein insists here that such acts of a feeling subject are always correlates of the value of another. If, she writes, these values are not derived values that belong to the person, like other realized or comprehended values, but his own values, if they come to given as an acts rooted in another depth in the feeling of non-personal values, if accordingly they unveil levels not to be experienced in any way, then the comprehension of foreign persons is constitutive of our own person, end quote. Now, this is where Stein's investigation of empathy really will have an important significance for ethical thought, particularly by way of perhaps theological investigations here. While I may value another, not primarily because of her specifically personal values, um, but, be, uh, but because in her psychophysical condition, she bears certain, certain values, for example, specifically sexual values relative to my lust, which not belong to her qua person, but which serve as the primary context of my dealings with her. Uh, on the other hand, where such is the case, it is clear that my own act of valuation is ordered to values which are essentially lower than those values intended in an authentic love of the person or specifically personal values borne by her. This is as much because the essence of personal values is in part to be higher uh, by comparison with non-personal values as it is reflective of internal hierarchical orders within the specifically personal values themselves. Shai continues by arguing that love, by contrast to any other act of the person, has an incomparable role in disclosing the value of the person. When love is directed at the person herself, however, Shai observes that this is not a valuing for any other sake. We do not love a person because he is good. His value is not that he does good, even if, perhaps, even if he perhaps comes to light for this reason. Rather, he himself is valuable and we love him for his own sake. And the ability to love evident in our loving is rooted in another depth in the ability to value morally experienced in the values of deeds. End quote. The ontological value of the person herself, that is the value which pertains to, to personal being as such in all of its individuality, particularity, and subjectivity, is a value incomparable to any other and is thus the highest of all values by essence higher even than the specifically moral values that is values of moral goodness, virtue, and their opposites, evil and vice, born by a person as an agent of moral deeds, as a subject of moral attitudes, and as responsive or unresponsive to objective moral values. Stein develops this idea through the use of an example, which serves to disclose the formal hierarchy of personal value to all other orders of value as such, pursuing her line of reasoning phenomenologically by elucidating the givenness of the essential structure of the value hierarchy in valued experience. With Shaler and Brentano, Schein insists the givenness of a value of any sort is essentially correlative to feeling, and she adds to the specific depth of the feeling. Again, a value is felt as higher, the, <clears throat> the deeper the feeling takes root within the depth of the eye, and it is felt as lower, the more superficially the feeling of its value penetrates the depth of personal subjectivity or the soul, as Schein understands it. This applies both to the feeling of a value as such, as well as to the feeling of the value of its reality. Drawn upon Brentano and Shaler, Stein even writes here that it is an essential validity <coughs> that the reality of a value is itself a value. However, the value of existence is evidently not as high as the value of the object to which existence may be ascribed, at least where persons are concerned. Stein writes, Pain of the loss of a loved one is not as deep as the love for this person, if the loss means that this person ceases to exist. As the personal value outlasts his existence and the love outlasts the joy over the loved one's existence, so the personal value is also higher than the value of his reality, and this former feeling of value is more deeply rooted." End quote. If we assume, in other words, that death signifies the cessation of existence in every sense, 
Yet it is po still possible for love for a person to continue even after the person's death. This can only be because one, the value of a person is independent of her actual existence. Two, the value of the person as such is higher even than this value of the loss of her existence. And three, it entails that the value of the person is higher even than her actual existence. Stein does not fundamentally alter this position <clears throat> over the course of her intellectual career. This is obvious from her assertion in the 1928 lecture to the effect that, quote, the personal attitude is objectively more justified and valuable because actually the human person is more precious, precious than all objective values. All truth is discerned by persons. All beauty is beheld and measured by persons. All objective values exist in the sense for persons, end quote. <clears throat> On the back of her observation concerning the formal height of personal value in comparison to the formal value of existence, <clears throat> Stein acknowledges in a uh, series of, acknowledges in a series of, uh, a number of formal laws concerning the hierarchy of values which expand upon uh, Shaler's and Brentano's formal axiology, which she has obviously inherited here. First, she insists that, quote, the comprehension of values is itself a positive value. Uh, to this value, to feel this value, of course, I must be reflectively turned toward my own value feeling with a feeling of approval, most likely in regard to the rightness of my value response. The feeling of the value of my value for Stein is obviously lower than the value value itself. This is obvious for Stein, from Stein's example uh, that I can both enjoy a work of art and also enjoy my enjoyment of it. In such an instance, the joy over the work of art will be a deeper one. If it is not, then one can speak of a perversion of the order of value here. In addition to this for first formal axiological law over and above those taught, clarified by Brentano and Shaler, Stein follows up with a closely related law concerning Positing, positive valuing of a negative value. She insists here that if it is not the case that, quote, to value a positive value positively is less valuable than the positive value itself, then it also follows that to value a negative value positively is less valuable than the negative value itself, end quote. In addition to such essential laws of the formal characterization of values of the person in superiority to non-personal values, of positive values and negative values, of the valuation of positive values, positive values, and so on, et cetera. Stein also considers the formal relationship of values to the acts of, of realizing a value as itself the bearer of a value of its own in relation to the sort of value realized. That is to say, Stein insists that the realization of a positive value is itself a positive value, while the realization of a negative value is itself negative. The realization of a positive or negative value, moreover, occurring in the context of personal acts, the reflective value of these acts according to uh, the value which they either do or do not actually possess, that is whether I value them correctly as positive when they are indeed positive and negative when they are indeed negative, or whether I value a positive value negatively or vice versa, play a constitutive role in the formation of personality as a bearer of its own value, especially in the constitution of the specific moral value of the person. This admission on Stein's part is significantly, it is significant in this much that it also discloses something uh, in addition concerning formal axiology to the extent that the moral value of the person, positive or negative, constituted in the realization of positive and negative values in the valuing of value realizing acts as positive and negative, <clears throat> uh, and in comparison to the actual value and quality of these acts, as well as the very power for realizing values in the world in this way are all quote, autonomous personal values, and above all, entirely depend independent of values to be realized, end quote. This entails materially that the dimension of moral values as values of the person are, eo ipso, of greater significance and possess a height incomparable to all other values of mere objects. This assertion, of course, must be qualified to the extent that the positive value of power for the created, creative realization of values may be absorbed in negativity of the realization of a negative value. In spite of this, however, it still seems to be the case that for Stein, the only value modality higher than the moral value of the person will be the value of personal being as such, within which all moral value qualities and the value of the personal capacity for the realization of objective values is founded. In her treatise, Individual and Community, Stein pays special attention to the egoic contents or the noetic moments in Husserl's language of the effective acts of valueception uh, or value perception and of effective attitudes. 
Such ego contents are the material of the value grasping acts on the one hand. On the other, they display certain important differences, taken abstractly, purely on the subject side of the value intention. Some egoic contents stand beside the ego, such as the feelings of pleasure or pain, while others do not stand beside the ego as its affected acts, but rather concern the ego within its own being, as she puts it. In other words, some affected acts take place on the periphery of personal life, and some such acts are rooted in the depths of the person and attach themselves to the person herself as the subject of these acts and is implanted in them. Easy go of contents can be considered an abstraction from any objective correlates, but the differences which they, they display in themselves then acquire significance for the constitution of various realms of value. With this statement, Stein announces the relevance of the thematic of depth and periphery, duration and intensity for the problem of material axiology and a theory of value modalities in shared sense. On the one hand, she delimits mere distinctions <clears throat> between value modalities without disclosing anything of their apparent hierarchical structure, as Shaler does. For instance, sensory, pain, and pleasure occurring in both contents which stem from the personal periphery, but which are capable of reaching inward and of seizing possession of it so exclusively that nothing else has been besides, as she writes. However, such feelings never reach the depth of the person herself and never attach to egoic being as such. The feelings of pain and pleasure announce the value categories of the agreeable and the disagreeable and form the motivational basis for the attitudes of sorrow and enjoyment. This category of value is obviously distinct from the categories adumbrated by feeling acts, which are rooted in the depth of the ego itself. This includes, in shine examples, feelings which are always correlative to the sphere of person, such as gratitude, trust, admiration, etc. These feelings intend the values of personal traits, comportment, and the persons themselves. Thus, I may trust the person according to the feeling of her bearing the value of trustworthiness as opposed to untrustworthiness, etc. Such feelings directed to the values of persons as distinct from the sensual values of the agreeable and the disagreeable may be further distinguished from egoic contents of anxiety, elation, and relief. These feelings are felt in the depth of the person and can take hold of the ego pervasively. These feelings are correlative to various value modalities which refer to themselves in their importance as in reference to the experiencing subject. Thus, I am anxious in regard to what would be harmful for me, <clears throat> elated in what is beneficial for me, etc. Finally, in bliss and in despair, the ego, quote, experiences its own self within this content and gets a look at its own value on the basis of this content, end quote. But given that Shaler had argued that such experiences of bliss and despair intend the specifically moral value of the person as good or evil, it is likely that Stein would think of the self's value in similar terms here. The presence of such distinctions between value modalities, of course, rooted in distinctions between, between modes of value feeling and their proximity to the ego, does not yet constitute a material axiology in Shaler's sense, since Stein has not indicated in any definite way, apart from her earlier characterization of the values of persons, as the highest values by comparison to the values of mere things, in what the objective hierarchy of values which she presupposes to a theory of the person should consist. On one hand, as Medelebeck has shown, Stein does, does offer, uh, in one place, an account of the subjective hierarchization of values for the person in the concrete structuration of the person's order of death and periphery and the response to values, and especially in the potency of experienced values to inject a motivational force into the framework of the individual by power, or what she calls Lebenskopf, or vital force. Uh, those values which are experienced as higher produce a greater impact on the life power of the person who is motivated more deeply by them. Those values which are experienced lower have a much less significant impact on the life power of the person uh, and is motivated uh, much more uh, superficially by them. On the other hand, we are all quite familiar with the fact that different individuals are motivated quite differently by different value modalities. To that extent, that one person is more deeply motivated by values of utility and another is more deeply motivated by aesthetic values of beauty does not seem to present us with materials for establishing an objective hierarchy among such different modes of value. That is to say, Stein's phenomenology of value seems, if we were to leave off here, to provide the framework for making sense of individual person's subjective systems evaluation and nothing more. 
However, she reveals her awareness of precisely this problem in the final passages of On the Problem of Empathy. While she does not go so far as to lay out the material theory of values offered by Shaler, she provides evidence here that she endorses Shaler's hierarchization of values as a development of formalism. The specific passages in which Diane manifests her thinking on this question take place within her development in conversation with Wilhelm Diltai, heavy theory of personal types. Stein begins by characterizing her own theory of spirit in terms of Diltai's hermeneutics. For Stein, Diltai had correctly recognized the rational lawfulness of spiritual and mental life, and in doing so, had characterized its lawfulness, that is, the free lawfulness of rational motivation as opposed to the law boundedness of nature, in terms of the inseparability of being and thought, and facticity and normativity in the cultural science. For, for Diltai, Moreover, this means that all lived relations, all cultural realities, etc., are themselves bearers of value, uh, bearing the standard of their estimation in themselves, as Stein puts it. Taking Diltai's perspective as her own, Stein continues by insisting that we must distinguish between the rational lawfulness of spirit on the one side and the objective value on the other, which spirit lawfully responds in value experience. The two stand in a relationship of essential correlation inextricably linked with one another, but nonetheless irreducible to each other. Nonetheless, Schein continues, uh, spiritual acts are experientially bound into context of a definite general form. Formally, we can characterize the structures of these acts in theoretical propositions. These propositions, in turn, can be formulated in terms of equivalent normative statements. For instance, Schein writes, there is the experience unity of action when a value motivates a volition. This is converted in pra into practice as soon as the possibility of realization is given. Formulated as a theoretical proposition, we have here the general rational law. He who feels a value can, and can realize it does so. In normative terms, if you feel a value and can realize it, then do it, end quote. In other words, formally, one can express the lawfulness of motivation in terms of the rationality of the flowing of spiritual acts in and out of one another, that is, from the valuing to motivating to, to motivating to willing. And this rationality is formally convertible with a formal normative law. However, the formal laws concerning motivation and volition, which can serve as the basis for formalist ethics, Stein admits, have nothing to say about the action's material value. This admission is important for Stein, as it occasions a transition to a new, albeit brief, discussion of the person, which attempts to penetrate beyond the formality of her phenomenological investigation of person as such, pursued thus far, by broaching the topic of personal character types, which for Stein, uh, following Shaler and Bill Ty both, is intimately bound up with value. Such types are not characterizable, however, in terms of a purely formal relation to value as such, but rather to individual material classes of values. Stein argues that the personalities reveal a structure of typical character. Moreover, she writes, because, because of the correlation among values, the experiencing of value and the levels of the person, all possible types of persons can be established a priori from the standpoint of a universal recognition of words. Empirical persons are realizations of these types, end quote. In other words, according to Stein, since personality is constituted in its correlation to values and the permeability of the person to different orders of values, an investigation of the full range of personal types possible can be pursued through a comparison with a universal standard of value, that is, an objective hierarchy of value ranks. Now, of course, Stein does not pursue such a priori typology in full here, but only offers some suggestions regarding such a project. Thus, she does not need to lay out her universal standard of worth here either. That the standard she is thinking of mirrors the Schillerian one, however, becomes obvious as she fills out her concept of personal types and its foundation in empathy. On the one hand, Stein argues that types of <clears throat> that types mark off a range of empathic possibilities open to many individuals. The individual, as such, is an eidetic singularity, understood as the lowest level of differentiation of types of ascending degrees of generality superimposed upon it. And as much as an individual comes to be constituted as of a type, it does so through its participation in more general types. The most general personal type of all, in which all persons participate, is the type spiritual person, who is a value experiencing subject in general. Determining the specific types of a person 
occurs through consideration of the individual person and her spiritual life as one lived in an experiential framework that is unified, meaningful, and intelligible whole, and linked together primarily in its coherence with the order of values. That is, one presents themselves to me as a scholarly type, for instance, inasmuch as their life is bound together by the prevailing order of values of scholarly work, for example, the intense interest in truth, falsehood, which penetrate the scholar to a deeper level than, say, the values of the artistic type, for example, the intense interest in creativity, beauty, etc., which stand in an order of priority relative to other sets of value, such as the values of the executive type, for whom such values are superfluous, by comparison to the leading values of productivity, leadership, profits, and utility. Each type that, is, that there is then presents a miniature its own subjective order of values and is typologically characterizable in terms of which, of which value or set of values crystallize as central or as highest for this type of that. However, it is important to remember that each type is established not in the multiformity of value hierarchies which they display, but according to a universal recognition of worth, that is, a universal and objective hierarchy of value. Each personal type, then, is axiologically significant in as much as it breaks for us a peculiar value modality, and from the perspective of Stein's leading concern for the function of empathy in the constitution of personality, through empathy I can, in the discovery of the personality types of four individuals, discover value modalities which I myself had not been previously open. Inasmuch as Stein had earlier argued the acquisition of new levels of values opens up a new level of my own personality. And likewise, inasmuch as she had also argued the ideal person is one who is correlative to a whole range of values, to the whole range of values uh, in, the rel in the present passage, Stein comes to a recognition which, <clears throat> given the trajectory of her own personal life and her own religious conversion occurring only a few years after the publication of her dissertation, reveals, reveals her as an atheist wrestling with a Schillerian axiology, which places value modalities in a generic hierarchy ranging in ascending order from the values of utility to pleasure to vital values, spiritual values, and culminating in religious values. Stein's discussion of value hierarchy, value typology, and empathy occurs upon the backdrop of the consideration of potential for fulfilled intentions and value modalities adumbrated by personal types other than my own. <clears throat> Um, Shine holds that personal typology both opens up and closes off the possibility for complete empathetic understanding of the other intertypological proximity to my own personality. That is, I can intuitively fulfill my intention of the other who is typologically similar to myself, in particular, inasmuch as she is moved by similar values to those which move me, and then inasmuch as she is moved in the same way and in, similar levels, in similar levels of depth to my own experience. On the other hand, the personal type, which is radically different from mine, cannot be comprehended in an intuitively fulfilled way, even through empathy, to the extent that empathy is dependent upon levels of typological similarity, which form the basis of understanding between persons. A truly alien personality is, in a certain respect, that in incomprehensible to me. This incomprehensibility is owing to the fact that such a personality is constituted in relation to values and value experiences that I cannot fulfill in myself. On the other hand, the mysteriousness of the alien personality, which is incomprehensible precisely on account of the unavailability of its characteristic values to me, can provoke an empathic experience which is revelatory of the fact of difference, as well as of some of its material content, although without that content being brought to fulfillment in me, in the absence of an additional experience and moral alterations of my own personality. In Stein, Stein's words then, quote, I cannot fulfill what conflicts with my own experiential structure, but I can still have it given in the manner of empty presentation. End quote. The alien personality and its value structure is given to me in empathy, even though I cannot immediately comprehend the personality and its values as the foreign person herself comprehends them. Nonetheless, Schein continues, quote, I can be skeptical myself and still understand that another sacrifices all his earthly goods to his faith. I see him behave in this way and empathize a value experiencing as a motive for his conduct. The correlate of this is not accessible to me, causing me to ascribe to him a personal level I do not myself possess. In this way, I empathically gain, a, gain the type homo religiosus, the religious man, by nature foreign to me. And I understand it even though 
What newly confronts me here will always remain unfulfilled, end quote. Stein gives, also gives another example of the experience of the person who regulates his life entirely in reference to the pursuit of material goods, ignoring all other value levels, which um, Stein himself considers important, revealing in that case the higher value, higher ranges of values which are intuitively closed to the materialist type. Do the divergences of the availability or unavailability of values either to me or to the other? Quote, I understand these people, even though they are of a different type. End quote. And we might add, I understand the order of values which these types announce, either positively by their presence in the experience and structure of the foreign type, or negatively by their absence in the foreign type, in contrast to their presence in the foreign type. Now, in this discussion, Stein reveals a couple of points which are of significance to our current considerations in elucidating her axiology with reference to Shaler's. First, it is clear that Stein takes Shaler's material axiology seriously and even accepts it in the fact that, although as a non believer herself, Stein empathizes the value of contrasts of the holy and the profane in the Homo religiosus. And although she does not fulfill such values in her own experiential structure, she does not for all that discount these values as unfulfillable in principle. That is to say, Stein does not absolutize her own value experience by excluding the value modality of religious values from the objective order as such, which she would have done had she insist instead interpreted the homo religiosis here, not as possessing a personality which she herself does not possess, but rather as being structured through a deformity of value experience, which pursues an order of values that is in principle illusory. Rather, Stein acknowledges the possible validity of the type homo religiosis and the genuine advance in personality which this type in principle represents relative to the universal standard of worth. Thus, Stein is prepared to acknowledge conditionally here that if there are such religious values, they must also axiologically be the highest of all value modalities, given the experiential response to such values adumbrated by the lived living experience of the homo religiosis themselves, whom I empathically encounter. Although for Stein at this point, the acknowledgement of such value modalities as her own personality type does not encompass remain unfulfilled, and according to her here will always remain unfulfilled apart from the experience of faith, this always should not be taken unconditionally here. Uh, this is so for two reasons. On the one hand, the value height of the religious sphere over and above all other spheres of value can in principle still be intuited phenomenologically for Stein. Inasmuch as I comprehend in the reduction the essential preferability of that religious to all, about all other values if such values can be intuitively experienced in concrete bearers or in and through religious acts. The possibility of which Stein acknowledges as evidenced both by the experience of the homo religiosus and also in the, the Socratic experience of the daemonic call of conscience to which she refers to in her, the final passages of the dissertation. On the other hand, the extent to which Stein also acknowledges the importance of empathy for the constitution of one's own personality reflects in principle the possibility of fulfilling value experience, which I empathize in another but lack in myself. Stein argues in this vein that I come to understand factual aspects of myself when empathically comparing myself to what I discover in another person. For instance, in the contrast between the accomplishments of the musical virtuoso I discover that my own meager musical accomplishments pale in comparison, and I thus acquire a genuine assessment of the true state of my musical talents. In this respect, moreover, I also discover, Shine argues, the value as well as this value of my own personality in a true empathy. She writes, quote, since the experience of value is basic to our own value, at the same time as new values are acquired by empathy, our own unfamiliar values become visible. When we empathically run into ranges of values close to us, we become conscious of our own deficiency or disvalue. Every comprehension of different persons can become the basis for an understanding of value. Since in the act of preference or disregard, values often come to given us that remain unnoticed in themselves, we learn to assess ourselves correctly now and then. We learn to see that we experience ourselves as having more or less value in comparison to others." End quote. Since the experience of the other then, can be revelatory of my own deficiencies in failing to respond to levels of value, which I comprehend in another, it can at the very least serve to announce new realms of value, and thus levels of my personality which as yet are undeveloped or underdeveloped. 
As such, it can announce my own value or disvalue and thus spark a moral struggle for the further development of my personality and my spiritual capacity to respond to values which I have not discovered purely within the confines of my own monadically structured experience. Thus, for Stein, the full order of values in a subjective hierarchy is one that can only be won through empathy, not through pure introspection, uh, pure introspective interrogation of my own exclusive value responses in the depths of my own soul. Now, uh, to wrap this up a little bit, um, the moral implications of this position are, I argue, quite profound. In conclusion, it will be possible to fill out our understanding of Stein's moral theory as it organizes itself around the correlation of personal value, uh, as it's been developing here. The ethical task for Stein, building upon this axiological framework, the one which is revealed in the interplay between the life of the individual person in her unique individuality, the communities in which she finds herself empathically, the created order in which she is placed in time and space, and the eternal order of being, value, and truth. Uh, including potentially at least God as its ultimate ground source and destiny. Now, Stein introduces the problem of ethical responsibility uh, as early as on the problem of empathy, where, as we saw already, she translates the essential possibility of the realization of a valuable state of affairs into the normative demand that she that one ought to do so. As Stein puts it later on uh, in her contributions to uh, uh, philosophy of psychology and humanities. Uh, she writes, to any just so being, whether it actually or only supposedly exists, there corresponds the good if so of value and the, the do so of obligation. The substance of these is what rationally grounds the emotional attitudes of axiological and practical convictions to life. Internal to the good if so of value, <clears throat> a properly, a properly understood, is a complex relation back to the facticity of states of affairs as they actually are in the world as well as to the essential being disclose, disclosing possibilities for how those states of affairs and the object which populate them then might be. But additionally, there is a correlative relation to the ought to be as well. Thus, Stein writes, quote, the good if so, insofar as you're dealing with a value yet to be realized, is equivalent to the do so of obligation. It impels the individual toward a deed aiming at the realization of the value, end quote. The implication of this for Stein's understanding of the general nature of the moral task of human life are several. First, it will, it will imply that the normative demand for any person at all will be the authentic development of an ethical personality, a goal achieved in reference to the ideal of personality, to the general the ideal uh, uh, condition of worth, in relation to which the person is open and principal uh, to the whole range of values in their proper ordering. Secondly, and practically, it will demand that the person understand that at the level of ethical practice, quote, any work on yourself, any effort towards cleansing of your soul can only consist in this, to suppress negatively valued deeds and stirrings in your soul and to combat the disposition to them, or even not to let them arise, and conversely, to hold yourself open for positive values, end quote. The result will be that ethical life becomes a matter of what Husserl would later call uh, renewal. And oil. In Stein's context, it will as well constitute an effort at repentance and conversion of heart uh, and mind in greater conformity towards the good and always cultivating ethically necessary dispositions of openness toward values, uh, the values of the world and the values of the other, including those of the holy other, God. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. A very rich paper. Uh, we're a little bit short to time, but I don't think all of us have got to rush off now, although perhaps uh, Dr. Anderson is, is an exception. Um, but uh, do, do we have any questions either from our, uh, for, uh, from our uh, physical audience or our virtual audience? I'm just trying to make a connection with my um, uh, Facebook page. The idea of values and the things that one would set from himself and how to apply or try to theorize. And for me, I study international comparative education. Sure. And so, in teaching and learning, how can I apply that? To yeah. The student's value and the teacher's value. And yeah. Actually, for example, you said there is, um, I'm sorry, I'm just, I'm still just processing. Sure, sure. So, there's just the idea of the values and being able to take an action. Mm -hmm. So 
the idea of be, be taking action itself, how to apply, for example, to a teacher, sure, and how yeah. to incorporate the system to your teaching, and as a student, how do I motivate you? So, sorry, I'm yeah. just making connection to yeah. things. That's why I'm attending. No, and that's, like to... that's a, I think, a really great and appropriate uh, connection to make, especially for Stein, given her own her own biography. Now, I just, uh, Dr. Silva asked me if I was going to give a little bit of biographical um, uh, background in the paper, and I told him I had planned on it, but that I would be happy to do so as appropriate in the, in the context of the questions and answers period. I think this is the perfect context for that. <laughs> Um, now, Stein, uh, she was um, uh, a, a woman, obviously, um, a, a Jewish woman, um, although eventually a convert to Christianity, uh, working uh, as first a student at Husserl, uh, then as uh, Husserl's um, first assistant, uh, uh, compiling, um, organizing, and uh, transliterating and transcribing uh, Husserl's massive uh, uh, Manuscript studies on a wide range of topics that eventually became some of Husserl's most important published works. Uh, after leaving Husserl's employ, however, she endeavored to get a teaching position, which is a woman in, in Germany at the time uh, was more or less impossible, especially given that Husserl uh, basically refused to uh, to recommend to the universities that they should change their hiring discriminatory hiring policies to admit a woman to faculties of philosophy. So Stein had to uh, find her own way uh, as, a, as a scholar uh, outside of academia. Uh, and so what she ended up doing was spending about a decade of her life as a, a teacher in a secondary school for girls. Um, at the point where she was able to navigate from uh, teaching in that context to once more and finally sort of teaching at the level of, uh, of uh, university studies, not quite formal scientific university studies, but um, uh, as a, an instructor of pedagogy, um, she was translating her experience as well as a phenomenologist, uh, her experience as a, a teacher for essentially high school age girls uh, to theorizing about education and what education does, how it works, and, and especially what are, the, what are the moral dimensions of this relation of uh, teacher and student, student and teacher, uh, in regard to a range of, of topics and value laden topics, necessarily, uh, as, as Shani understands, all being as valuable. And one of the things that she uh, she really mentions in, in her uh, these are 1932 and 1930, early 1933 lectures on uh, pedagogy uh, is the notion that. Um, all education is ultimately uh, targeted at the formation of the, of the person of the student, and reflexively also the formation of the person of the or personality of the teacher. So that in a kind of uh, intersubjective interplay between teacher and student, there ought to be a kind of uh, increasing openness to values, and especially the values of ideas um, as conveyed between teacher and student. Uh, but one of the things that this means for Stein is that in drawing connections to a uh, to student and to their own personal life, uh, the teacher has to be especially attentive to uh, the ethical um, and the ethical goal, uh, which is to develop the student's potentialities to become the person that they essentially are and ought to be by providing conditions for the, the, the student themselves to encounter these ever higher regions of value uh, and to map their, their personality onto that. So this, this poses a question for Stein, well, how do we accomplish this practically? Um, and in, in many respects, for Stein, this is uh, something that, that has to occur on the back of our if you want to put it this way, objective scientific uh, interactions with the students discussing the subject matter. It's the informal but, learning. Well, I mean, yes, but um, but what's essential here is is that this is a kind of medium for uh, what's more fundamental, which is interpersonal encounter. Um, that is that interpersonal relations are what open us up to uh, new undisclosed, previously undisclosed. Uh, and, and especially higher orders of value that we may 
not have yet discovered and not opened ourselves up to to encounter their value in their actual state uh, and also therefore the the normativity that they call to me in their realization is um, the, the idea is that through interpersonal inter interactions I discover higher values I, I discovered their possibility and if I discover their possibility for shine I also discover I'm called to fulfill them I'm called to realize them so I mean concretely what this means that in the in the classroom the teacher is is obviously to talk about a certain objective set of, of materials but that is or ought to become a sort of medium through which an interpersonal relation of teachers do, uh, is established and in that um, we have ethical possibilities that are otherwise not there but i hope that makes sense yes, so, yeah thank you so very much you're welcome I'm good. Thank you so much. <laughs> There's someone. Yeah. Um, I guess uh, if, I'm sorry if I'm interrupting, but uh, I had a I had a quick question. Sure. Okay. I just want to make sure you could hear me. Well, first of all, again, uh, let me echo Richard's comment. A very rich and interesting paper that uh, really did introduce Stein brilliantly. I thought, and uh, you know, in all of the facets of her work, I wanted to focus on one particular facet. Which, uh, which is very wide ranging. And I apologize for the fact that this question might be a little bit <laughs> you know, beyond what you can really deal with in this, at this moment. I'll try to focus it in. The, the issue is the lived body. And I know that Stein had some very interesting things to say about it. And of course, for Husserl, it became increasingly important in, as his thought progressed, uh, not just in terms of my own encounter with reality, but the constitution of reality as an intersubjective reality and, and the whole question of empathy in, in Husserl's Cartesian meditation and so on. But specifically, I wanted to focus on um, the question of, and I think, by the way, this relates to her issue, discussion of depth and periphery and, and so on. But uh, for both James and Descartes in their very different ways, the body is really, really essential to our emotional and affective experience. Um, and I think, that, I think that Stein talks a lot about that. But I also uh, got in the sense that it's possible, I mean, I think she also identifies spiritual emotions and is, is very much committed to the idea that emotional life can, uh, could <laughs> exist without a physical body. And, yeah. uh, and, and so that's, you know, that's an interesting perspective. I guess I was just curious if you had anything to say about that specifically, about the place of the lived body in the realm of affect, and since that's so central to the realm of uh, evaluation, personhood, and you know, the, and ethics, basically, you know how that all plays out. And I know it's a huge question, so just address whatever yeah, you. Yeah, yeah, it is. It is a big question, um, and not just within Stein, but but within um, the phenomenological tradition more broadly. Um, and I think that how Stein will will address that question, is, and as you said, she's. In principle, open to uh, the notion of uh, affective life, an emotional life, without uh, a lived bodily component there, at least to the extent that she is open. Um, and actually, throughout her works, even in her, her pre Christian or atheistic uh, period, to the, the idea of a, at least the possibility of personal immortality. Um, so, the separability of, of uh, the spirit and the body. Uh, now, I think that how she will deal with this question then is that um, our, our, our affective states are obviously instantiated in a body. Uh, if I am upset about something, if I'm not just mentally upset, but I can feel this resonating out into my body in, in various ways. I may feel more tense or I may feel like there's a, a, a weight on top of me that, that announces in a certain respect uh, that I'm feeling in this way. Um, but what Stein uh, insists, and I think she follows Husserl uh, in this respect, is that these are, uh, to borrow some Husserlian language, uh, hyletic dimensions of the, uh, of the experience that are in principle separable um, from it. So um, the meaning, so to speak, of my being upset is not in the feeling of being weighted down or in the tension that I have in my body 
uh, even if these are the carriers, the bearers, the Tager, as she puts it uh, in German, of those emotive states. So, um, so yeah, the, the intentionality of the act of feeling upset, of being upset, this is something that uh, can and in fact does occur uh, without the mediation of, of a lived body because I can be upset without knowing it um, or my being upset at something can be can become submerged in my conscious life and, and reassert itself later on. Uh, even as I go through other lived bodily affective experiences that one would think are in principle even incompatible with uh, being upset. So I, I can have uh, lived bodily experiences of joy and things like that that are, that are operative, even as below the surface, I, I still carry my discontent over something. So I don't know if that, that helps too much, but um, but I think that's at least the direction that, that one would go. And as, as you said, it's, it's a big topic, but. No, that's absolutely. Um... here yes absolutely no that's very helpful it's a huge question and uh i know i think that's a an excellent you know response thank you yeah. and i think it, it has uh implications for for the, the topic of ethics too because um if the uh, develop if, if ethical becoming is a, as i've suggested it is for Stein a matter of the development of personality by opening up uh these uh higher realms of my personality and conformity in response to uh, an objective range of values that, I mean, in principle, um, one would say perhaps with Aristotle that uh, if virtue is something that requires not only that I, I know the right thing and I do the right thing habitually and characteristically, but I, I also enjoy the right thing, then in, in principle, I think that for Stein also, this would mean that uh, our, our motive responses and even resonating out in the lived body should reflect that development of personality as well. Uh, and so the development of personality is not just the development of kind of my internal spiritual life as divorced from or separated out from my body, but it should resonate out into every dimension of myself, including how I carry myself through the world, how I experience that world in and through my body, et cetera. So I, I think that this is definitely a, a relevant and important question. Yes, yes, absolutely. Now, thank you for that additional, uh, you know, direction, because that's kind of what I was looking for as well. So I appreciate that. Wonderful. Thank you. Okay, do we have any further questions? Uh, Alexander, yeah, Mark, uh, maybe one, um, one thing that has remained unclear to me, uh, not, not because you were not, uh, because it was, so to say, on the, on the margins of, of your text, yeah. with your very rich text, as you already said, thank you very much. Uh, on the one hand, there's sort of set the tendency that there is something like a platonic axiology, which is so to say out there in some kind of real, yeah, which is obviously yeah. not the material realm, and which is presumably is discovered mm -hmm. in preferring things, in producing yeah. uh, aesthetic or whatever mm -hmm. kinds of judgment. On the other hand, especially towards the end, you started speaking about things which made it more. Understand intelligible to me how, how values are created mm -hmm. because you were speaking about the openness, uh, about coming to know new values. Yeah. How, how do these two things work together in her? I mean, on the one hand, so to say, this kind of platonic exology, and on the other hand, this openness to yeah, developmental um, consideration. Yeah. So, I mean, there are, I think, two different ways that we can approach that question. I mean, one is the historical milieu in which Stein is working as sort of um, inheriting and reacting to responding to Shaler. Shaler has his own uh, response to this question and Stein, uh, I think presupposes it through a good portion of her, her early career before in her final work, Finite Internal Being, she's gonna directly address this problem uh, as a problem of metaphysics uh, or ontology, as well as sort of what's also gonna be uh, related to it, although, although in many respects implicitly um, as a problem of history and, and of temporality. Um, so one thing that we could say that maybe unifies both that Schillerian and the later Steinian uh, explicit effort to deal with the question would be to say that, um, and, and I, I would maybe want to clarify or correct uh, part of how you've, how you've uh, expressed the, the, the distinction between kind of the platonic 
uh, realm of values are always, always, always already there uh, that we have to discover, and then the creation of values. Um, I, Shaler and, and Stein, I think, would want to shy away from the idea of creation so much as realization, mm -hmm. um, realization of, of value. But in any case, that, that interplay is something that becomes quite important. Um, so that Einstein will insist that there is something like an uncreated eternal um, order of values, uh, which she'll designate with the, the concept of, of essential being. And, and this, uh, this category uh, in her ontology, later ontology, it embraces not just value, but, um, but uh, any kind of meaning, um, so far as meaning is <clears throat> Something that uh, we can differentiate at two different levels, the level of, of sort of a historical, a temporal absoluteness, and, and then the, the level in which it, it becomes actually realized in the world. Um, so there's a kind of dynamic interplay, um, which means that value, yeah, it, it is always already there, um, and it's above temporality, above history, and yet it's a matter of historical struggle for us to re not only to realize uh, uh, actual values in the world through my comportment, but as I, I learned to be uh, generous and to, to realize the value of generosity, but also even to discover um, values uh, in time. So that I, there, there's a possibility of, of moral development of, of humanity over across time, or also of devolution of our to the side of things. So, so yeah, I mean, this is a, it's a complicated kind of dynamic uh, that uh, calls for a lot of further uh, reflection and, and investigation. But it's uh, she 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 does have that that problem on her mind, uh, especially towards the end of her life. When of course, like part of what she's reacting to uh, is not just abstract ontological problems, but she's reacting also to uh, the concrete problems of history as as Germany sports. Notification and and uh, and sentences and all these things. So the problem of, of history and the problem of value these, these go hand in hand for her. Um, but I think what she wants to insist is that if we're going to have something like um, an objective normative ethics, we have to have this um, dimension of essential being and include some notion of value within that. Um, and at the same time, um, values become realized in the world at particular times, places, and, and manners. And this is going to vary not just according to time and place, but also how I individually realize values. So and she's not going to argue for something like a, a, a kind of universalistic ethics where we all are trying to fulfill a certain ideal that's exactly in exactly the same way and, and we all have to kind of conform to that. But that we're all going to instantiate this in, in uh, radically different personal ways, um, it's so far as we realize uh, not just values, but our own personal values as unique and, and uh, common people. So I don't know if that. No, sounds like a really very rich theory. Thank you very much. Well, we will soon be releasing you. Okay. Uh, thank you. But before we do, we have one further question from uh, uh, Dr. All right, hi. Uh, thank you again very much. And following on Professor Cooper's very interesting question, uh, I was thinking all uh, while you were talking, uh, especially with regards to empathy. Yeah. And thank you again for a very rich uh, talk and, uh, and how uh, Stein is a very interesting refutation of the usual accusation of phenomenology that it doesn't have an ethical theory. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Which I think is, is uh, fascinating. So, but uh, I, I was I was thinking about um, uh, that last part we we're talking about, the normative, that is trans-historial yeah. and sort of yeah. a platonic realm of axiology and uh, versus a personal realization as uh, to what extent you see that, okay? And particularly in connection with the concept of empathy, because empathy is always related to the other, mm -hmm. as a, a way of uh, a phenomenological reconstruction of axiology and ethics in response to Levinas. Okay. Because Levinas, yeah, yeah. in, uh, in, in totality and infinity, mm -hmm. and, uh, and his discussion of the other, 
Yeah. He always assumes that the other is a refutation of the terminological position yeah. of subjectivity and uh, and and the Husserl's interest in uh, a study of consciousness as a study of essences. Yeah, yeah. And I really like the fact that you stress Stein's commitment to normativity, mm -hmm. whereas I feel that that normativity gets a little bit shaken and attacked with the 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 infinity uh -huh. uh, and the utter unattainability of otherness right, right. in Levina and later Derrida yeah. afterwards in their sort of onslaught against phenomenology as a study of the essences or in subjective and intersubjective experience. Yeah, I mean, so so, so, so yeah, I, I think that that's uh, that's a great question, and, and uh, I have to admit, I, I don't have a, a huge familiarity with Lev Levinas, but I mean, so far as I understand uh, him and I understand the question, I, I think that um, like one of the things that you would say about Stein is that um, she seems to differ from Levinas primarily in the, the idea that uh, otherness uh, could be. Um, could be a, a kind of, of uh, sort of infinite otherness or, or a, a holy other. Um, because the thing that uh, a, a certain Steinian uh, scholars like Antonio Pacanio at the uh, University of Toronto, he's, he's really, I think, done a great job of pointing this out. In, in the reading of Stein's theory of empathy, um, we have to understand that, of course, empathy is this deep structure of consciousness that is the condition for the possibility of objectivity or experience of objectivity in the world. Uh, but what underlies this and, and what is its, its foundation is uh, kind of Stein's commitment to the idea that um, empathy is possible, not just because of these various personality types that make it more or less easy for me to empathize with the other, but that, there, that I'll never encounter a human being that is a holy other so far as we are still human beings. So there is a general essence of humanity that we share. And it's a common point of departure, no matter how different from you are. Um, so, I mean, that I think uh, represents a kind of challenge to uh, a notion that um, the experience of the other is, is sort of by definition the refutation of my own subjectivity and my own encounter of the world. That is um, rather the experience of the other enriches my experience of the world and my own subjectivity. And that, that's kind of the point for Stein. That, I, I become myself really only in the encounter with the other. Um, my subjectivity is incomplete until I encounter the other and thrown back upon myself to, to recognize who and what I am sort of in that encounter and by that comparison. And also, ethically, I, I discover the possibilities of my own growth uh, and my own uh, need for growth uh, in that respect. Um, so I, I don't know if that, if that helps too much. Yeah, I mean, it, it helps a lot, particularly the, the finitude of the encounter yeah. with the other. Yeah. Because as far as I understand Levinas, it's always about the infinity right, of right. And you are making it clear that it's it's yeah. finite and within the structure, within a normative of structure of yeah. subjectivity, which I think is a yeah. very and I, I think that I'm always sort of uh, yeah. uh, postulated again without having a full Experience of Levinas and understanding of the work, but I always sort of postulate that maybe a lot of what goes into that for Levinas is the trauma uh, of the war uh, and the trauma of uh, being a Jew um, who is being become kind of the, the enemy of, of a whole race that were, and has, has a race become a whole other relative to uh, the, the German nation. So I mean, he's, he has this. Um, I think a uh, perturbing experience that leads him to, to think of, of otherness in this way. And of course, Einstein can, can relate to this to a certain extent, but it doesn't, even though she, I mean, she ultimately dies in, in Auschwitz, yeah. um, but it, it doesn't ever lead her to that loss of connection, even to the other who is the Nazi or the, the other who is, who is Hitler. I mean, she, she still is going to recognize him as human. Human being with whom she could have a potential relation, and that relation could could have an ethical dimension to it that uh, might even be uh, radically beneficial for, especially for the, for the Nazi, <laughs> and encountering a truer, uh, truer picture of, of uh, the value of the values of person, especially. Uh, I know just one final uh, comment on your um, 
kind of your premise to my question, which was that uh, uh, Stein, in a way, uh, challenges that that old um, accusation that phenomenology doesn't have, have an ethics. I think that uh, that that maybe is is precisely what leads me to want to uh, focus on Stein's thought in the way that I, I am. Because what I think is is really the case is not so much that, as I said, Stein never writes a work titled ethics. And she doesn't she doesn't do that. She doesn't write a work that's focused purely on ethical questions. But her whole corpus is interlaced with these kinds of ethical reflections that I've, I've tried to elaborate here. And what I think is true of not just Stein but not all the else universally is the idea that. Um, Phenomenology maybe doesn't have ethics precisely because it challenges the notion that we have an ethics as such, that ethics is just a, a sub discipline of philosophy that we're entitled to specialize in, uh, in abstraction from all the other problems of, of philosophy. And I think that what Stein is really doing and what unifies all of the different studies throughout the course of the work from on top of empathy all the way up to finite internal being is that she's, well, what unifies her work is a concern for, as I said, uh, the question of what's what is a human life and what is human life meant to live for, um, and she addresses that question through the study of empathy, through the study of uh, uh, philosophy of psychology and humanities, through the study of politics, through the study of uh, of educational theory, and all of these different things. Um, and I think that what she's endeavoring to say <clears throat> is that to do ethics we need a comprehensive and holistic philosophy, philosophy as such, not just tightly focused discussion of uh, what's right and what's wrong. So we can abstract that from the whole constellation of philosophical problems. So that, that's why I think that her work has a real value and real potential. Thank you.